Okay, I think we'll get started. Um, greetings, everybody. My name is Khan Ross. I'm the new spokesperson for Global Solidarity for the Green Party. Good evening and welcome. Every Monday, we're gathering Green friends, members, and supporters for conversations with elected Greens, activists, and change makers of all kinds to explore green policies one by one, as well as how each policy connects to the other to create the systems change required to deliver environmental, social, and economic justice for all. With COP26 coming up later this year, we'll begin by exploring our policies in a way that helps connect us with some of the ripples of change needed to create the green wave locally, nationally, and globally. Before we share the policies we're going to explore tonight, we would like to remind anyone watching that no policy is an island, all policies impact emissions, equality, and jobs, and none of our policies work alone. They connect to create a web of change that devolves powers to power to community, in communities, enhances the lives and rights of all living things, and brings justice and equity to both people and the planet. If you'd like to watch our No Policy is an Island event, Holly will share a link in the chat now, which you can save for later. Before we start the conversation, a bit of quick housekeeping. There will be time for Q&A in the last 20, 45 minutes of the event. We ask you, you to use the Q&A function in Zoom and not use chat and use the upvoting function to make the questions easy to find. Tonight, we have a very rich panel to speak about important aspects of the global challenges impacted by implementing green policies. Um, we'll start with Cleo, who has to leave at around 5.30 to take her son to football. Uh, Cleo, if you could introduce yourself, how long have you been with the Green Party and what inspired you to do this work? Cleo, by the way, is the former Lord Mayor of Bristol. Great, thank you, Khan, and, and greetings, everyone. Glad to be here, and I, I do apologise again that I've got to leave early, although we're a little reluctant because it's so hot to play football, but we will go. Yes, yeah, so um, I've been a Green voter for most of my adult life, and I joined the Green Party in 2015, and I was encouraged to join off the back of my work as an activist in Bristol. It was the... Um, Meryl, our Green mayoral candidate at the time and others who just suggested to me have I thought about standing as a councillor and I hadn't but in the end in a roundabout way I did stand and I was elected in 2016 to Bristol City Council and I've just finished my five-year term. Um, people would have known me as an activist focusing on class, justice, racial justice and things such as reparations which are connected to that. During my term, my five year term as a councillor, I also became the first Green Lord Mayor of Bristol, the 11th only woman and the first woman of African heritage to hold that post in 801 years. I was also a campaigner with Countering Colston, which was an activist group set up to dismantle the public celebration of enslaver Edward Colston in the city of Bristol. So when I became Lord Mayor, one of the first things I did was actually remove the portrait too of Edward Colston and another one of Lord Nugent from the parlour wall. Some of you will know that last year I ran to be deputy leader of the Green Party, coming a good second to our incumbent. And also more recently in May, I stood as the police and crime commissioner for Avon and Somerset, coming in third and just receiving under 65,000 votes on a quite a radical policy of reform, racial justice and drug policy justice. The quest for justice um, in terms of the memory and injustice served against my African ancestors and racial injustice today and injustice generally started when I was a child with my mother who is described as white British taking me on a number of protests from the age of around six some of which included anti-apartheid and the rest of it, Stop the Asylum Bill. This was matched also with my African Jamaican father, who was very proud of his African roots and did what he could to educate me, including giving me a book at the age, at age of nine called Black Americana, which charted the history of my ancestors being taken out of Africa, initially by the Portuguese, and charting the advancement 
genius, struggle and achievement of African Americans. So um, the person I am today was very much shaped by my childhood. Thank you, Cleo, that's terrific. Um, our second panelist is Annika Jane Dorothy, the Executive Director of the Green Congress of Kenya. Um, Annika, if you could perhaps briefly introduce yourself and explain what inspires you to do the work that you do. Uh, thank you, Russ. Um, as you've heard, my name is Anika. I am uh, ED at uh, Green Congress of Kenya. It was quite a journey getting into the green space. I never thought uh, I would be in the space. I started out by really being passionate about governance, but never about climate uh, governance. And um, well, when I started my internship, my then boss from I Choose Life Africa was really focused on climate change and the conversations about around renewable energy. And somehow I got myself in the space where I was working with the uh, communities in uh, Machakos County to develop um, community driven policy solutions to combat uh, climate change because it's quite an arid area. As luck would have it, uh, my next job as well was in women entrepreneurship in renewable energy. And this really focused on economic justice with regards to climate change. You know, what, what are the gaps that make women lose uh, income or participate less in the economy due to the issues of climate change? And so that is how my journey in, in the climate space started. And I went on to um, uh, join the Green Congress of Kenya in 2016 when it was launched. And we are now almost five years old, you know, running with this. I have taken this um, green agenda to many global spaces, most recently the Generation Equality Forum, where I participated in the first design sprint that now was able to include feminist climate justice as a key action coalition. And we are looking to do a lot of great work globally in that space. So that's about my story. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anika. Um, our other panelists all, are all members of the Climate Emergency Policy Working Group, David Flint, Georgia Taylor, and Jonathan Essex. David, Georgia, and Jonathan, if I could ask you briefly to introduce yourselves too, and then we'll kick off, kick off the discussion. Well, thank you, Khan. Uh, I'm David Flint. I'm a convener of the Climate Emergency Policy Working Group, and I'm co-chair of the, uh, the England and Wales Party's COP26 steering group, which uh, links the various activities we're doing in preparation for the, uh, for the thing. Uh, in terms of why I'm engaged, well, climate change is the biggest problem we face. I don't think I need any more reason. Georgia? Hi, thank you. Um, yeah, I've been a Green Party member for on and off 10 years. I've, um, I've just been elected as um, East Sussex County Councillor um, and uh, I have been a parish councillor before. Um, I've worked in international development for many years. I, I worked in government from 98 for the Department for International Development. Um, and I've kind of battled my way through this uh, sector the whole time, mostly focusing on um, gender equality and women's health um, and women in business. Um, and the climate issues have just become more and more present um, in the countries that I've worked in the South. Um, and I'm I got in, probably got into this sector because my dad's from Argentina and uh, well, my mum grew up in Bristol and was from a kind of violent, very um, underprivileged background. And the combination of her commitment to social justice and my dad's international background, I think probably kind of pushed me into this um, sector. Anyway, um, I'll pass on to Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan Essex. I joined the Green Party of, after returning from Bangladesh in the spring of 2005, which inspired me to, to get involved in green politics, perhaps more than anything, um, through a conversation with a rickshaw driver um, there in the middle of, of some flooding. Um, uh, I was elected as a Green County Councillor and Local Councillor um, from 2010 here in Red Hill, and, and I've continued to work part time in international development. More recently, I've joined the Greenhouse Think Tank, focused ma mainly on climate jobs, industrial policy, and more recently, exploring the international dimensions of facing up to a climate reality as part of a, a Greenhouse book. Um, 
In terms of international aspects, uh, I've just enjoyed a lockdown co-analyzing co the customs declarations of the UK in 2019 to produce a, a full uh, carbon footprint of the UK's international trade transport by product, country and mode of transport. And that's really highlighted the gap to me uh, between climate deals and trade, deal, trade deals in the right to COP. Uh, my current work um, is, is focused on on looking at how to eliminate single-use plastics, particularly in Asia, and, and producing guidance of how climate activists should engage with trade unions and workers on airport expansion. Sorry, that's terrific, Jonathan. I'm, I was muted there. Uh, that's Thank you very much to all of our panelists for joining us. So let's kick off with the discussion. Annika, if we could, perhaps start with you. What are the issues of the global south with, re with regards to climate change? And how do we get the global north not only to recognize those issues, but also contribute towards allevi alleviating them? A very general big question to start off with. Yes, uh, thank you, Russ. Well, I think the, the most important thing is mainstreaming conversation and not only mainstreaming, but actually taking action. I. I know there has been a lot of back and forth in the global north with regards to the awareness of climate change, the effects of climate change, and not only that, but the action towards elevating climate change. I remember my first time in the UK, this is quite embarrassing, but when I first came to the UK, I was given a, a, a single use a pl plastic bag at, at a shop. I think it was Salisbury or something. And I remember being really afraid for the first five minutes because I was like, am I going to get arrested <laughs> for having this bag? Because in Kenya, we have actually banned all use of plastic uh, bags. So I, I found it really weird. When we started banning this use of plastic bags, everybody was like, how are we going to survive? But here we are, a third world country, making it without uh, plastic bags. And we, I can't even remember what it looks like. So until we t we have political will uh, to to make these radical changes it meant uh, eradicating a whole industry and now government is even cracking down more to go towards um you know the the food cans you know this these things that we don't see as important so when uh the issues of the global south in terms of climate change are vast, but of course they are different from the global north because we are not a, ma a manufacturing continent as, as much. Uh, we are not emitting as much as the global north, but we do suffer the effects. Uh, some of the issues that really come up are access to water um, um, and access to renewable energy as sources of fuel. As you know, a lot of the global south are covered by rural areas. There are few towns in between, but a lot of them are focused, you know, are covered by uh, rural folk, uh, farm, farm women and, and, and uh, men, you know, making their way about, but they still have to walk kilometers to access, you know, water because due to the various um, cutting down of trees and the various um, effects of climate change, our forestation is going down and down. And you've realized that if, when, when we have um, issues with forestation, even Egypt makes, us, makes a lot of noise because it means we are affecting the primary source of the River Nile. So once we don't have um, forest cover, our water is affected. How does that affect us really, if you, if you think about it? Just count the number of hours a girl has to walk to get fetch water, come back and put it at her home, and then go to school. So by, by this, climate change is affecting girls' education. It's affecting the time women are supposed to be using in economic activities. Instead, they spend half their day fetching firewood and sources of fuel. And that generally affects our whole you know, economy as, as, as in, the, in the global south. And in addition, when we look at government policies, uh, most of the time we have parastatals uh, controlling sources of energy. This is detrimental to us, of course, because they have put specific uh, measures to um, to make it harder for people to access, you know, solar energy and things like that. So when we look at regulation, we are still overly regulated. Of course, corruption fuels a lot of these conversations when people don't want to 
to make it easy for others to, to get renewable energy. But then the major issue is how is the global not affecting this? When the UK, for example, cuts down their global aid from 0 0.5 to 0 point, from 0 0.7 to 0 0.5, we are heavily affected because they're the ones pushing government in some of these conversations, like setting up a specific county, um, county is like local assemblies and local governments. Uh, they're, they're not mainstreaming uh, environment as a conversation. So when we remove some of this external support, then this setting up of these structures suffer. So I could go, of course, um, on and on, but I think if we focus on economic justice and relate it to climate change, then we'll realize that even the global north needs to take bold steps in holding big multinational companies to account and not just have a transition, but have a complete halt to production of um, you know, global emissions that happens. Thank you. Right, Anika, thank you. Cleo, if I could turn to you, um, when the climate impacts do come in, due to our 200 plus years of extracting from other countries, we have already the infrastructure to deal with it, which is one of the many reasons we owe a debt to those we've been harming to create this privilege of security. How does your work relate to this? What Green Party policies do you feel acknowledge the responsibility we hold here in the North? And where do we need to improve? Right, well, as a reparations activist, um, I would acknowledge by saying that privilege is relative, but in order to mitigate the global refugee crisis that's coming or is already happening, death of people and planet, and from what some people are terming climate colonialism, we urgently need a redistribution of wealth globally. Or we, we also need, in my view, a reframing of humanity and what it means to be a human being a renaissance of our shared humanity and our relationship to the earth and the land. A redistribution of wealth is necessary in order to empower and level up other countries in the global south so that they can better mitigate the disasters that are coming. In terms of policy that we have, some people may be aware that in the autumn conference of 2020, we actually passed a motion for the reconciliation and reparations for Britain's role in the transatlantic traffic of enslaved Africans. And the terminology is important there because many activists are moving away from the term slave trade, which is obviously still commonly used and understood, but it doesn't really factor in the human aspects there or the extent to what had happened. And it also doesn't suggest, it suggests in fact, an equitable, equitable relationship, which of course it wasn't. The motion was passed with over 90% of our members voting for it. So this is something that as a Green Party we're committed to. We're committed to supporting activists in this field. And I think it's important to note that that motion came about through the ongoing collaboration with activists such as Stop the Maangamizi campaign, We Charge Ecocide and Genocide and Green Party members. Key areas of that motion include, again, lending support to the call, which has been led by campaigners to call for an all party parliamentary commission of inquiry into truth and reparatory justice, which is um, again between grassroots campaigners, if you like, and the government acknowledging the harm that has been done and the harm that continues to be done globally, because part of reparations is actually stopping the harm that goes on. And we can see the extractive industries are still continuing the harm. We all know that the um, transatlantic of trafficking of enslaved Africans was fueling the industrial revolution. And I think we can guess or um, make our um, conclusions about what impact that's had on the climate and the movement. So the responsibility there of what we as a nation have had historically and continue to have. Um, also the infrastructures that we have in place and the wealth generated here in the UK came, as we know, at a massive cost through extraction and death on the continent of Africa and in the Caribbean, which is why it's right that the campaigners are charging ecocide and genocide hand in hand. I think I would also add that, you know, we should never marginalise the sacred aspects of this movement and the connections that all of us would have had at one point and other cultures do have in terms of their connection to the earth, how cultures revere and work with nature and how this has been, how people have been severed 
from this connection because this is part of what we need to also repair in terms of us going forward globally. Right, thank you. Um, David, if I could turn to you, the human and financial costs of climate break breakdown fall to those least responsible for causing it. What obligations do that, does that create for developed countries and especially for the UK? And why are these obligations not being met? I, I speak with some, some caution after these two eloquent ladies who, whose heritage connects with this in a way that, that <laughs> mine connects too, but on the other side, um, the guilt for this clearly lies with the whites and the English. But put that aside, we here, we recognize the harm that has been done historically. And coming out of that harm, there are fundamentally three obligations, I think. The first is in the immortal words of Dennis Healy, when you're in a hole, stop digging. And in this case, that means let us stop making things worse. The second is that we have an obligation to reverse the harms that we've done uh, by whatever means are likely to work. And the third, given that some of that harm cannot be reversed, we have to think in terms of comp compensation. And in the COP documents, the term loss and damage is, is used. Um, I think it's fairly clear what that means. Uh, the damage is likely to be is physical, but in any case, money in some very large quantities is involved. I'd make one general point about this. Most of the harm that is being done by climate change now is not due to the emissions that are occurring now. Most of it's due to emissions that have occurred over the last hundred years, maybe longer. Uh, this year's emissions add just two and a half percent to that, and thus that much the damage. So the clear requirement is for us to get the level of uh, greenhouse gases down from the atmosphere, not just to get the emissions down. Um, it's a big task and it won't be done quickly. Thank you. Um, just to comment on a quick comment that's come up in the Q&A. Uh, at the moment, we're asking questions, or I am asking the questions, but the Q&A questions that you pose will be put to the panelists when we have a Q&A session uh, for the last 45 minutes of this session. So please do keep posting your questions and upvoting them. Georgia, uh, Parliament has committed to spending 0.7% of GDP on overseas aid, though the Tories have just cut this to 0.5%. Why do we need to raise that proportion to 1% and contribute to climate finance as well? Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so the we had already made a commitment and, and had only just started reaching that level of 0.7%, in fact, and it is in, you know, enshrined in law um, by successive governments. So, um, and this is inter an internationally agreed target as well. There are several countries that do spend 1% of GNI, which tend to be the Nordic countries. Um, and that certainly to do with, you know, um, historical um, reasons for the need for reparations now, you know, there's, there's a huge, huge deficit there. So, um, but just going on to the issue of the climate finance, so we, with the overseas development assistance, climate finance has actually been taken out of that. So even when it was 0.7%, the UK government and several other governments have been taking their climate finance out of that amount, even though it is actually supposed to be, as per the Paris Agreement, it's supposed to be an additional to the overseas development assistance. Um, and so we've kind of been shortchanging the, um, you know, the global south. We promised something, and we haven't been giving it. Um, and uh, in addition to that, um, you know, it's uh, we we've done some research looking at well, we've looked at war on once research, where they have estimated the um, need for reparation or for payment of the climate debt, which is the our historical damages. Um, and they've estimated that it needs to be, um, it, it would work out about being 30 billion per year. It was one trillion um, pounds. So it worked out about being 30 billion per year, which um, works out at 1.5% of GNI. 
So that would, that's just for the climate aspects. That's not the overseas development assistance. So, you know, and that would be in addition. So I think we've already got a policy for 1%. It's already been agreed um, through conference and, and was um, voted in and it has appeared in our um, manifesto for the overseas development assistance. So what, what, um, what ideally should be provided is another 1.5% in addition to that as per the you know, estimations. Um, and that's why it's important because we have a debt um, we, uh, on two aspects. And I might go more into you know, what we think about that a bit later with your next question. Thanks. Thank you, Georgia. Clear, we're going to take advantage of you just before you have to pop up with a, a final question, perhaps enlarging a bit on what you've already been speaking about. What is the problem that makes the atonement and reparations motion you help create and put forward necessary? How do reparations fit in with solving the climate crisis? How does it all fit together? Thank you. Um, and just to come back quickly on a couple of questions that I've noticed in the chat. One, I think, was from Janice, who was talking about, um, you know, wealth redistribution is, is a great idea, but will it ever work? And I think in relation to reparations um, for the transatlantic traffic and enslaved Africans, it is a conversation that's becoming more mainstream. And there are families and those who have benefited who are starting to try to atone and put some of the wrongs right, understanding and realising that although it's history, it has a legacy, uh, a contemporary legacy. So I think um, we can feel slightly hopeful. And of course, as more people are aware of this and there are more movements being made, you may have heard quite recently Jamaica making a charge against the Queen for reparations. Of course, that has got some um, legal doubts whether you can actually do that when the Queen is the head of state. But nevertheless, it's raising awareness. And it's um, as we raise awareness, perhaps we'll see more shifts. We've also had things like the UCL, who did a kind of track and trace on the um, legacies of enslavement, particularly in relation to the compensation that was paid to enslavers once abolition came. Um, and also Stephen's point, yeah, I think you're right. We may see more empathy with the global south um, now that we're seeing more floods and disaster here in Europe, for example. As I've already said, the leveling up is needed. But again, um, sometimes it comes with a, a, the attitude of do as we say, not as we do. And I think we've we've heard from David and Georgia actually about how the, the, the issues that we have today are factually are um, from history. So the carbon that's here and the and the problems we've got are, are not from things that have happened in recent years, but are historically. And we we all know that Britain had a major part in, in doing that. I think it's interesting if we also track some of these extractive um, colonial powers, if you like, historically, and actually where they are today, and we can track them quite easily. Unilever is a major one. And whilst it's interesting, isn't it, that they've come out in the last few days saying that they're now going to label all their packaging with the kind of carbon footprint, great. But actually, what are they still doing in places like Nigeria, which actually became not really a country, but something that was under a corporative rule? So I think it's important to um, look at all these things and, and try to educate and inform. And I think what's also been quite positive since we passed the reparations motion is that there have been a number of workshops with leading experts in the field of reparations from you know different places in the world to discuss this to help more people understand it and understand the connections between climate change and what's happened historically and how important it is so i would also encourage anyone who sees any of these things coming up and there should be one again coming up again for councillors to really take note of that and to um, attend I hope that answered the question. If it doesn't, can you remind me of, and also things, you know, other policies that we have, where, where, where is the money going? You know, um, nuclear weapons or arms trade and arms generally, we're, we know we're anti-Trident and it's about where, where is the focus in this country? Where are we putting our resources? And, and these are all things that, you know, are part of Green Party policy. Right, Cleo, thank you. Thanks, I think you've got to dash off now. Uh, but thank you for being part of our panel. Great um, to be here. Bye, everyone. Bye bye. Jonathan, going to turn to you now. Um, how does the UK impact the ability of other countries to cut carbon? And how does this link to our international finance impact in terms of things like military trade and aid? 
how can we how can we address social and environmental justice in a way that works for people and place both here in the UK and abroad? Big question. Okay, um, I'll give some thoughts. I don't know if they're the best ones, but um, it's the start of a ten at least. Uh, well, firstly on aid, I, I totally agree with what George just said about that. The fundamental is is that you know this is not the night time to cut aid as we're running up to hosting an international climate conference. This is the time to separate our climate finance commitment from our aid commitment. And, and that means we should be giving more money, not less, to those most in need of, of help around the world. Although maybe help isn't even the right word. Um, we've shifted our aid, aid in, in recent years, to some extent it would seem to facilitate, you know, these bilateral trade deals we're setting up post Brexit. I think what we should do is putting our aid back to its original focus on help, helping the countries where there is the greatest poverty, the greatest need, which is also perhaps those that need the greatest help in dealing with the climate front line. But it's not good enough just to focus on, on adaptation. Uh, a lot of the aid money on adaptation seems to be focused on, on mythical things such as climate resilience in, in roads, um, which is an excuse for just more, more roads. Um, yes, we need climate resilience, um, such as the mangroves in, in Bangladesh, um, natural resilience as well as, well as physical investment, but that needs to be joined up with visions that enable a country to leapfrog where we are today. So for example, in, in Rwanda, I was working on a project looking at a strategies for town planning for their secondary cities and how they might leapfrog um, the UK and US and move straight from uh, uh, bicycles, not through cars, but straight onto electric bikes and, and, and retaining low traffic neighbourhoods as part of their city planning, as something which is being talked about now in the UK. But going back to Bangladesh and those mangroves, I mean, what we're ha what's happening at the moment is, is we're flying uh, prawns uh, from places like Bangladesh, which, which is re resulting in those mangroves being cut down uh, while we fly crabs in the opposite direction around the world. And, and that really has to stop. We, we really need to make that link between trade and climate finance and aid and join things up. I don't really have much to say on military, I'm afraid. I think, Khan, you, you probably are uh, have far better suggestions on what the alternatives to the military might look like. But I mean, I would just start by saying we need to have a strong climate agreement. Uh, we can afford not to cut our aid simply by uh, not increasing our nuclear arsenal, at, at which breaches the International Non-Proliferation Treaty and expanding our, our Trident weapons. We, we could sign up to the International Call for Ecocide. We could recognise climate change as, as a, a a valid reason for for being classified as a refugee and being able to seek asylum in another country. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, Anika, let me turn to you again. Another big question. What is the political solution to the global challenges on the climate crisis we face? Can you give us a sense of your vision of what a political solution globally might look like? Right. Um, you know, one thing in, uh, is that politics is local. And uh, as much as we have, you know, multilateral spaces, all these people are sent to power by talking to the local community folk and, and getting their goodwill and then, you know, ascending to, to these positions. And so it is very important that we institutionalize uh, the climate uh, agenda in the local councils and in the local um, um, representation wards in, in, in our case, and ensure that, you know, these legislators understand, and not only their legislators, but also the community understands. And that means also increasing, you know, our output of environmental experts from, from our, our local universities in the Global South as well. And this will help mainstream uh, climate change as a conversation and who will be this to account, but not, uh, and not just ending there. My second, um, solution would be adopting proportionate representation while you know across board in the global south for elections to allow for green legislators into power as opposed to the current past past the post system as you all know many african countries uh, and many global south areas have uh, fast past the post system this means that even if somebody had for example more uh, uh, around you know maybe 49 percent of the vote this 49 percent does not get a say in government and in what you know policy, and this is really detrimental. Uh, the Greens in many elections are the underdogs, right? And in the last election, like uh, Kenya, we participated in the 20, 
17 general election just a year old, we had so many number twos and they counted for nothing with very high, you know, um, uh, votes. Uh, the same thing happened to Rwanda. And so uh, as a policy in East Africa and, you know, and Africa Greens, we're trying to push for proportionate representation adopted, you know, across the board. Of course, it's not easy because it means upsetting the balance of power, but it is necessary to ensure that we have, you know, legislators who are green at heart, understand the green ideologies and the issues that the people face with regards to climate change. And that will begin to change policies in, in, in the local assemblies and in parliament. You know, for example, uh, we recently had renewable energy being zero rated, you know, for tax, renewable energy products. But what happened? Because the, 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 we didn't have a majority of green uh, legislators. This led to an influx of defective solar uh, products from, from, from China that now made people even lose faith in the green, you know, in, in this solar revolution and green energy. And so it, it is necessary for us to have, you know, those uh, um, at least a minimum requirement of, of, of representation. And lastly, I would say um, consolidating a renewed vigor and movement among civil society towards um, climate change. This is for accountability to hold government to account because we remember um, may her soul rest in peace when Wangari Mathai was still alive. There was a movement, you know, like what Greta has brought to the global North, right? Not saying that the, uh, our civil society is not working right now, but we need to relaunch and you know this this movement with a bigger agitation and at least a five point agenda that is repeated throughout the global south that you know consolidates governments towards this. And I think um, mobilization, organization, you know what Barack Obama called community organizing in the civil society space in climate change needs needs some sort of injection of course needs resources and needs a way to awaken this conversation hold, to constantly hold our governments to account thank you anika david coming to you a question about terminology we have climate finance loss and damage adaptation and mitigation uh i must confess i'm not alone in finding this terminology confusing how does it all hang together in fact does it hang together well, I'm not sure that it does, Khan. It, it seems to me that we, we have to distinguish the reasons for which we might be transferring money from the mechanisms that we might use. Um, and at the moment, we, we get all that jumbled up. So the, the, the reasons might be the traditional aid of, you know, of charitable giving, the reparations in which we put right the damage we have done historically, and then you know, working together with other countries for things that provide a, a mutual benefit. Now, those things can be, the first of those can probably be done through existing existing channels. The second of those probably needs to be done through something called the Warsaw Mechanism under the UN, which I must say I don't understand, but it is intended to, hand, to do that job. How climate finance fits to this, um, I'm not sure. Um, it may be, maybe Georgia or indeed you would know better than me because it's kind of a sort of piece of UN theology as far as I can tell. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of UN theology. Um, uh, Jonathan, if I could turn to you, um, where is a good example either locally or nationally of Greens, whether individually or as a party implementing or campaigning on these issues? these international issues? I think sometimes it feels really hard to campaign on an international issue when you live in a place and you have a life in a place. Uh, but I think it starts with in integrity. And, and I think a, a green perspective on the world is recognizing that we aren't, we aren't a national party. We're part of a global green movement. And it's that global perspective that makes Greens take on inequality quite distinct um, from, from other parties. We, we need to, to think that way, to, to live our lives in a different way and reflect that in our, in our policies. Now, I'll give you a personal example. Um, I was working on a, on a project with, with Greenhouse looking at uh, the international trade emissions. And, and we found out that 36 million tonnes of carbon uh, a year is, is the, just the transport part of international trade. Uh, and, and then I, I live five miles from Gatwick Airport and found out Gatwick are planning to double the size of their international air freight. And air freight, rather than shipping, is the thing that's driving that faster than anything else. 
and and it was and it was in the lockdown and we realized that many of the people i knew locally knew people who were losing their jobs because under covid the airport had virtually shut down it was 97 percent i think reduction in in, in passenger numbers. So we wrote a report uh, collectively, uh, a couple of us plus the PCS trade union representatives, and it was called, a, it is called a Green New Deal for Gatwick. And what that calls for is rather than jobs which effectively hang the local economy where I am on, sort of sky hooks or aeroplanes, if you like, um, dependent on, on exploitation around the world, it's about recreating th that sort of employment base locally through green jobs, through creating you know, jobs that transition us to a zero carbon here. And, and, and I think it's, it's understanding the links between that and, and other places that's key. Another example I give you very, very briefly. So I was, I was on a workshop last week discussing degrowth and globalization. And um, a, a delegate um, on, on, the, on the seminar was, was working in the fiscal department of the Indonesian government. And she said, well, what do I do? I can see what your net zero policy is like, but our exports are exporting fossil fuels to you. And, and we're being told we need to cut that, but instead we can export nickel um, to replace all of your cars with electric cars instead. Well, where does that leave us in terms of development? Now, where does that leave global equality? How do we shift? And, you know, so I think, you know, understanding where we are, understanding where other countries are, which is much more difficult, but then trying to link it to something which we can do where we live and, and also in, a li in our lives. Thanks. Those are great examples of connecting the international with the national and indeed the local. If you um, have a chance, Jonathan, uh, and have a link to it, could you pop the uh, URL for the Gatwick report into the chat so people can perhaps have a look, a closer look at that if they're interested? Um, Anika, if I could turn to you now uh, about the Global Greens Group. Uh, what is your experience of the Global Greens Group? Has this international collaborative effort given you hope and inspiration? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, most definitely. You know, because the differences, because there are differences in the issues of climate change in the global north and south. When we, when, when a group of uh, young Greens come together, passionate about the environment, there's a tendency to feel lost in the larger conversation. When, when, when young, let me say, young Africans are together around a, a lake or a river, trying to conserve it, and they listen to uh, the, the uh, Friday for Future movement talking about global emissions, and they can't see even one single factory around them for miles and miles, they tend to kind of get lost. But being part of uh, this uh, global greens movement, having a home within the East Africa greens, then the Africa greens, then sort of creates a unity of purpose. It creates a sort of blueprint of where we are from and where we are going. And then how do we continuously hold each other to account? They, it, it feels the global greens provide a platform for people to come and you know air their grievances and say you know this is what is happening this needs to happen it provides just a space to ventilate to to strategize and also to aspire to be part of because when we look at the recent waves of uh, elections in the european parliament in um, in, in germany you know the 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 tentative uh, wins that could happen there in Korea as well. There is a lot of encouragement and especially for young people in, in, in the African space right now, we're really uh, encouraging and uh, uh, by we're really encouraged by young people getting into office. A youth candidate receives a lot of support these days. And what we are looking at is how to inspire a movement of young green politicians. And that is what we are doing in the Green Academy. So definitely the Global Greens provide a great space to, to you know, hope that this, this is possible. And this conversation, this political narrative can one day have governments of Greens, you know, going back and forth amongst each other. Well, brilliant. That's a very exciting prospect. Thank you. Um, we're now, it's quarter to six. We're now, we've got three quarters of an hour for Q&A from other participants. Um, I'm going to select the questions that have received the most upvotes. Uh, so apologize if that doesn't include your question. Um, uh, at the first question, Georgia, I'm going to ask you to perhaps ask, answer this question. How is the redistribution of wealth to be achieved? It's a noble ambition, but really hard to bring about. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, there's loads of examples of it being done all over the world, um, you know, post-war 
UK, etc. You know, there's there's um, there's lots of examples, you know, nationally and and internationally. So I think you know the the concept is more or less proved. But I, but the issue where it's complex, and I want to just go back to a few things that the other people were saying which is um, to do with the complexity of the trade relationship, our consumption, and then how does, you know, how do climate finance and overseas development assistance fit in with that? Um, because, you know, whilst we might think we're redistributing by giving um, funding to other countries, at the same time, we're taking away. And so, for example, I just looked into, um, as a, as a case study, I looked into Nigeria because I've worked um, there quite a lot. And the UK um, has, you know, is, is imports um, from Nigeria. And about 90% of the UK imports from Nigeria are oil and or petroleum products. And, um, you know, the, the, the harm, not just that that causes for covered emissions, but the harm in Nigeria itself and particularly in Ogoni land where there's been, you know, poisoned river and food um, sources and people's, you know, rights have been abused horrifically. Um, uh, you know, that you'd think, oh gosh, we've got this great trading relationship with Nigeria and they're getting, you know, foreign income from it. And you might think that's part of the big you know, redistribution, but actually it's not for quite a large number of people in the country. Um, so, you know, redistribution has to take account of all of those things and whether it's actually fair, the kind of trade that we have. And even within, you know, projects for climate finance or, or overseas development assistance, you may have um, projects where there, I mean, I was just recently part of a project where they were training farmers the designing a training for farmers and they were going to invite um you know pesticide producer companies to the training it was this was in kenya and i just said no you can't you can't invite these companies to the training this is you know and these were subsistence farmers who probably had never put pesticide on their land and you know there was just this kind of assumption that that's what was going to happen and not really taking into account the bigger picture. So sometimes the kind of funding that comes from places like the UK isn't, you know, isn't really taking into account um, all of the issues. So you think you're redistributing or, or you're making things fairer, but actually you're not. So it has to be really rigorous and you really need to integrate the principles like things like, um, you know, gender equality and social inclusion across these programs, as well as the climate issues. Um, yeah, I hope that kind of answers the question. Over. Thank you, Georgia. Um, quick turning to Holly Rose. Do, do, do you want to comment on this? I see that uh, there's a possibility you'd like to answer this question live. Did you want to comment on this or shall I move on? No, not at all. I just do that so that we can um, send it down the line later on. Uh, okay, sorry, I misunderstood. Um, all right, the next question is that question, uh, this question is from Stephen Carney. Um, do you think that the recent flooding in Northern Europe um, will finally bring a, a change to our posture on the global south and countries already experiencing the worst effects of climate change? David, perhaps if I could throw that one at you. Yeah, but Khan, I think it already is. If you look at the things that uh, German politicians have been saying in the aftermath of the flooding, including right-wing politicians, everyone is now saying it's climate change. Um, that's something that you heard from the left and the Greens previously. Now it seems to be pretty generally understood. Angela Merkel is saying we must do more. Well, OK, so far it's words. Um, and we all know the difference between words and action. But I think it is moving us in the right direction, um, together, of course, with the uh, in North America. Sorry, got a bit of daughter disturbance here. Um, thank you. Um, let's let's go to the next question. I'm deliberately firing these uh, individual panelists rather than putting each question to the whole panel. I think that that will allow us to get through more questions. Uh, Jonathan, if I might 
offer you this question from Andrew Jenkins. Should the companies that have caused the majority of the carbon emissions historically be taxed for this, such as Shell, Exxon, etc.? Um, I'm going to ra be radical and say no. Um, and the reason I say that is but I don't think a market based mechanism of carbon taxation alone is, is going to solve it. I mean, yes, the Green Party policy is to have high carbon taxes. But I think what we need is the companies and the government to both have plans to get rid of all of their fossil fuel production and do it as quickly as possible. So, um, yeah, I think there's a place for taxation, but I think governments need to show the leadership. They need to have a plan. We need to have a plan collectively as to how we're going to eliminate the need for these fossil fuels and to put ourselves on different pathways. So we need to involve trade unions. We need to work on a on a just transition. Um, we, we need to have policies that disrupt, so policies that, that ban uh, rather than just tax, so that there are limits on production, and, and, then, and then that will create the incentive to shift production in different directions. Right, thank you. Um, Anika, I'm going to throw this one at you. The next question is from Alessandro Lurgo. Um, it's about food plastic packaging. How do we get rid of food plastic packaging? How do we lobby the supply chain? I know in Kenya you've had some particularly interesting experience of this. Yeah, uh, of course, the one thing that, you know, was stopping it was the, the big money bags, uh, the producers. We, we don't have a lot of manufacturing, but we do, we do have uh, an area in Nairobi called industrial area that is full of all these manufacturers. And it took a bold, um, a bold minister who is now our ambassador to France, Judy Wakungu, who just said, we are giving you two months to transition. And if you are a plastic manufacturer, then transition to renewable and renewable sources of packaging and, and stuff. And, and, and that was uh, done. So even the people were against it, even us, the citizens, one were not happy about it, right? And it was mandated because now when you, before we used to be given like bags for free when you buy stuff at the, at the supermarket, now you go to the supermarket and then you have to buy a bag, right? So what, what it did was it increased, it created a new source of income. Before we used to get plastic bags for free whenever you buy something, but now you have to buy whatever you're carrying your stuff in. And if you don't want to buy, you have to come back with the one you used. So one thing that you have to note is that we, you have to come up with an economic plan that gives um, these uh, big suppliers uh, probably rights to be now the producers of the new alternative uh, source of packaging that could help mitigate job loss and mitigate their, you know, their, their businesses so that they don't go under. We also don't want to totally kill the economy. But one thing that is clear, you have to take radical changes. Um, when we did this, I think it was uh, for five years, I think it was 2016 around there, um, we were not ready. No one was ready for, 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 for this change. And just this year, actually last month, the government announced now in the food packaging space, we are getting rid of all these packages, which means in the next two or three years, we'll be totally rid of plastic across you know, all sectors of our household. So uh, it is important that we get our politics aligned. The lobbyists who keep on making sure that these people are in business, it has to be a set timeline, You know, like how you guys did Brexit. It is coming whether you like it or not. Uh, and so that is how we need to start tackling climate change radical halts to this issue to these uh, things that are bad for our environment um and 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 these manufacturers trust me they like profit they will adjust they will find a way to survive in any case if we don't do that then we will say that we, we would never have moved towards the digital era you know if we're looking at, at profits and everything it is upon them to innovate how they remain in business but of course government support needs to be necessary so that we don't kill the economy as well Thank you. Terrific. Thank you for that answer. Um, the next question comes from Martin Tiller, and I'm going to throw this. This is a, a question. I'm going to throw this to all the committee members of the Climate Emergency Working Group. Um, and if any of you feel most comfortable answering this question, please shout out. Um, Martin says he was glad that Jonathan mentioned the carbon footprint of global gro groceries. Is anyone pressurizing? the UK's online supermarkets to make it easier to select products with lower food miles. This seems to be a blind spot, even for the most ethical 
the more ethical reta retailers. For example, Waitrose's apples are described as coming from New Zealand, France, South Africa, U the UK, Argentina, Chile, and Italy, which makes it totally impossible to select a lower carbon option. David. Yeah, I think we, we need to be careful about this. Um, transport emissions matter, of course, but transport emissions amount to something like 10% of all the emissions associated with an, within our imports. The other emissions come from the processes by which the products are manufactured, or in the case of agricultural products, grown. And so the same issues arise um, for manufacture and growth as abroad as they do here. So distance is only part of it. And sometimes, uh, depending on particular cases, it may be lower carbon to have something coming a long way rather than a short way, providing it doesn't come by plane. So air transport is clearly the bad guy in this. But after that, often you have to be quite, uh, quite careful. Um, analysis often shows that you simply can't rely on your intuition as what is the low carbon option and what is the high carbon option. Um, anyone who doubts that should read How Bad Are Bananas, uh, which is a very interesting book and goes into a lot of this stuff in, in some detail. So um, I would rather that the supermarkets labelled their products, not with, uh, not with transport emissions, but with the total emissions associated with that. In any case, we have to have that if we're going to have a carbon tax on imports, which is part of our policy. Is anybody talking to the supermarkets about this? Um, I'm not. Um, others may be. Some supermarkets are interested. Uh, one northern chain of supermarkets has had work done on this to understand its carbon footprint. Others may have done and wouldn't necessarily have published it. Right. Um, Anika, I'm going to turn to you for this one, please. A uh, question from Michael Miller. Um, climate policy globally should include cooperation with nations like China, he says. My experience suggests that they're moving quicker than the West on the green agenda. Do you agree? I don't think they're moving um, necessarily quicker but I think bringing them into the conversation is imperative because they are taking over a lot of, you know, global, the products that are consumed globally. And, you know, they're big on manufacturing. So I think because they exist as not so much of a democracy, but, you know, sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, I, I don't want to say a dictatorship, but, you know, somewhere in between, getting them on board would actually mean that if their government decrees um, some of the, this climate change uh, programs, then, you know, they would be implemented in its entirety because what, you know, you know, gov uh, Ch the China government is good at, at effecting their government policies <laughs> without question. Uh, but, you know, if we continue to ignore um, them in this conversation and we continue to, you know, seclude them, they're still the biggest producers of plastic. When we're, even as much as Kenya is trying to remove plastic from the market, we still import a lot of goods from China, like clothes and stuff. And these things come packaged in plastic. So unless, you know, the, um, uh, we, we, we loop them in the conversation, they will continue to bring plastic to areas where plastic has really been banned or not only plastic, but you know, they will continue to, to provide emissions. And if, and if they go and, and check because nobody wants to talk to them and everybody's fighting to fight against them because you know, they're coming up as an economic giant sort of uh, almost uh, recolonizing some African states as, as you've heard, I, uh, you know, I was shocked like our, our train station, you know, since it's built by them. When you call, sometimes you hear Chinese language, sometimes it's English and you wonder, hey, it's supposed to be our country. So leaving them out of the conversation is doing us more harm than good. And I think big nationals are, are like, like the UK, the France, the European uh, uh, unions and, and, and USA need to have a conversation with them to, to make things um, better for the global south because we are bearing the brand of this economic tough war sort of. Right, thank you. Um, Georgia, a question, if I may put this one to you from an anonymous attendee. Uh, it's an interesting question. Climate change is an international problem that requires an international solution. What steps can we take to ensure that the Green Party here in the UK, that our policy is more internationalist, including in our comms, we are, after all, the only global political party, 
also how can we support our global green family particularly those that are smaller or less well resourced mm, that's um that's a, a really good point i i don't know if we do provide any i'm just picking up the, the last part of the question i don't know if we do provide we probably do have some kind of subscription to the global greens but i'm not sure how you know funds are distributed out to other local parties but david probably knows more about that than me um but yes having more of an internationalist i i mean i think that it's not to do with internationalist i think it's more to do with um global solidarity um sorry i've got to plug my computer in um and um you know because lots of people think okay you know international that's gonna that's gonna sort it out but if we don't have um i mean pretty much going back to what Pia was talking about before if we don't have you know the the our focus on um you know climate and social justice um then you know there's there's no point in it so i think that it's more to do with global you know climate justice rather than just having an international view and also being interconnected and I think that the global greens you know do a great job of bringing people together but obviously we we all need there to be more financing for this kind of thing um, so maybe David could just give us a bit more information about how that works I'm not sure that David can okay <laughs> my under I mean as, as Anika said politics is local you win elections on the ground in your locality or, or in your national assembly um, and that's true for all the Green parties. Uh, my understanding, and I'm, I'm, I'm a bit involved with the Global Greens, but not very much, is that there isn't much in the way of money flows from the richer countries to the poorer. Um, Anika may, may well know better than I do. Um, there is also um, some, in, some linkage uh, in relation to COP26. Uh, we, are, we are engaged with Global Greens, uh, the Global Greens working group on this, uh, and, and they with ours. So, we are trying to make this work, but there is scope for us to do a lot better, uh, to build a common understanding of policy and to share it, share political experiences and all sorts of experiences. Um, and that's that's a job to be done. It's not something which we have in control, uh, unless, um, Anika, you know better than I do, which you won't know. Uh, no, no, not really. Um, I mean, not so much <laughs> than you, but, uh, yeah, I, I totally agree with, you know, with you as, you know, if, if we can't educate, you know, the locals and then contribute to a larger a movement, I think, as I said, mobilizing is really an important part of achieving uh, results in, in climate change, you know, as we did with the gender equity uh, and, and are currently doing. So even as we move towards uh, COP26, how are we organizing within our regions? I think it's important that we uh, we, we strengthen and resource. Of course, there's, we need to be cognizant that as much as um, we are passionate, we need we need to find avenues of resourcing uh, the climate change conversation and the climate change advocacy. So moving towards uh, COP26 in an organized uh, manner that is supposed to be actually facilitated by the Global Greens as the unifying uh, body, in my opinion, then you know we can achieve some of some of these things. But definitely, I wouldn't say uh, that I, I, I'm, I'm much much more experienced, of course. Okay, Anika, thank you, um, David, Georgia. Um, next question, uh, I'm gonna throw at Jonathan, if I may, from Stephen Carney. How do we support alternate interest industries in the global south, such as in the Amazon basin, to prevent climate damaging activities while still ensuring that those economies can grow and provide for their citizens? Thank you. Thank you, um, um, Carney and, and and Carney for the for the question and the and the, and the sharing. Um, I think that's. I think you've almost answered the question though in, in in the asking of the question. I think we need to support alternative industries in the in the global south, rather than expect the global south to take on on board our industries, whether it's our companies going into those countries and replicating what we do here for profit to arrive back in London, or or, or just to buy. Um, products from our industries while while they 
that uh, export mainly primary goods to us uh, and suffer from poor terms of trade locked in by perhaps new um, bilateral um, Brexit trade agreements that, that are signed up by the elites of those countries but don't necessarily um, support the citizens. So, so I mean, I, so I, I really think it starts with us. I think to support those alternative industries, we've got to stop crushing them by palming our industries off on them, whether it's in their countries or, or here. And that means constraining our corporations to be responsible in their activities around the world. I think also we, we can set a better example. So just for, for just to flag one industry construction, steel and concrete production globally is one seventh of global carbon emissions. Now, if we expect alternative industries to these global giants to exist in the global south, we need to develop alternative ways of building our buildings here in, in the UK. And uh, we, we've, we've got halfway in, in the UK in terms of the Green Party policy. We've said we will um, recycle the, the steel scrap we have rather than making new steel from blast furnaces. But ultimately that's only a, only a stopgap. We, we need to uh, not uh, produce more uh, materials in ways that emit fossil fuels and, and shift instead. So technology transfer and patent transfer and capacity building are all things which were signed up to in, in the Rio agreement back in, back in the early 1990s. So I, I think what we need to do is to start to practice um, what, we've, what we've already said needs to happen. Makes perfect sense, thank you. Um, the next question is about reparations. It's, I think it was directed at Cleo, who of course isn't with us. Um, so again, I'm gonna throw this open to our panelists and uh, invite volunteers to answer it. Um, but the question is about reparations from Andrew Jenkins, who would benefit from the money the people who were moved or the countries they were moved from. Arguably, the African countries made money from selling slaves too. I, I can jump in. Please go ahead, Anika. I can jump in there because uh, in Kenya, we have a case study where the UK paid the Mau Mau. I think you're probably by now aware of that. Um, around 5,298 people, if I'm not wrong, who are compensated. These are people who are tortured during the state of emergency that, that was declared in the 1950s, 1952 to be precise. Um, it was a, a long case that went on. So when you, uh, but the statement that was given by um, the, uh, I think it was Michael Haig, who was um, the, the foreign uh, office uh, minister at the time, uh, indicated that, um, sorry, it was William Haig, indicated that it was not um, a settlement that would provide a precedence because the nature of um, British colonial administration was different in each country, but there was specific instances of torture and abuse in this specific uh, uh, context. And this money went to individuals who actually at the time of payment were around 101 years, you know, and, and a lot of uh, them had died and I think the money went to their next of kin or something. But of course, this uh, conversation brings up issues because it, the Mau Mau was um, centrally in uh, central Kenya, but there are, you know, people who were in other regions, like in the Rift Valley, who also fought for independence. And then it sparks up these conversations. Um, I think, uh, you know, what is important is the how of um, the conversations on, on, on reparations, um, which, which is necessary, I think. But also, if we are really to look at stopping this conversation on reparations, then let's, you know, also refocus on neocolonialism and stop you know, these advances that we are having where, you know, uh, global South countries are finding themselves trapped in these horrible relationships, you know, like uh, with, with, the, with the funds that uh, IMF has because we have, you know, different rates of interest. Um, but I would say that the structuring of reparations still needs to be well, 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 well done. It's it's uh, still it's still vague. The how of it is still in conversation. The questions that you're asking are still being asked by government and also being asked by the people asking for reparations. So there are no yet clear set answers. But I'm sure with continuous conversations we can be able to. But also look at if if we are to um, 
get this money then, um, and, and the question comes up with the people who had already died, for example, then how, how about improving the standards of living for the descendants you know, of these people? Right, thank you, Anika. Um, the next question is uh, about the urgency of the situation uh, from Alessandra Lergo. Uh, isn't 2030 too late for any change? We're already seeing non-linear changes in the climate. Why are we waiting? Uh, Georgia, perhaps uh, I can ask you to answer that question. Yeah, good, uh, good, good question, good point. Um, uh, well, yeah, why are we waiting? I come up against this every day where in everything that I'm either my work, my paid work or in the council, um, we seem to, because we work within complex environments and people focus on particular things. We seem to be unable to see the complex system and the interrelatedness. And so, and um, every a lot of people are just very overwhelmed. So I, I find sometimes that movement isn't happening. I don't, I mean, I think the Green Party from what I can tell is proposing the most kind of radical and urgent solutions So we could go further, you know, and we could go quicker. In terms of increasing from 0.5% of GNI to 2.5% of GNI overnight, it would be possible, but you'd have to employ a whole load of people and you'd have to completely restructure the way the work is happening. So you would expect there to be some kind of time lag. And there are also international institutions that you'd want to work with to improve the way you know they are um, targeting and you know for example the IMF which Annika just mentioned um, and and the whole kind of um, sort of culture around the aid industry as it is um, so you you know there would be some kind of time lag to make sure that the money is doing what it should be doing and it's and it's acting like paying a debt. Um, I don't think it's as easy as just handing it over, but then, you know, uh, maybe we haven't tried that yet. <laughs> but so, um, yeah, I agree. There's an urgency and we need to get on with this as, as soon as possible. Thank you, Georgia. I, I don't know if any of the rest of the panel comment on that. It's such a big and important question. I'm sure I'm speaking for all of the panel. We share that sense of urgency. Jonathan. I would just like to contrast two different political ways of looking at 2030. Either it's the date by which we have to have policies passed, which is the government's position, it seems, on things like you know, boilers or electric cars, or it's the date by which we have to finish. And I think the biggest challenge quite often in politics is certainly at the local level here with the council, we've passed a climate policy, we've passed a strategy, we've set some targets, we've got a deadline, but there's no delivery happening at scale. And, and I think the challenge with 2030 is, you know, it's it's an end date, not a start date. And I think that's one of the things that this government doesn't quite yet get. I think you're too generous. I think you assume that the government has a sincere intention of solving the problem. And in the case of our government, I don't believe that's true. Um, I think a lot of what is said is mood music to uh, quiet the the rest the rest of ranks. Um, actually. Uh, and particularly at the very top, there's no serious intention. And we should just recognize that these people are not going to solve the problem and they've no real intention of doing so. And therefore, uh, that you know, the pressure to do it has to come from outside the Tory party and indeed outside the political system to a large extent. Um, it is a very difficult problem. Right, thank you. Um, I'm going to turn to the next question now, which is from Richard Ramsden uh, about technology to help us mitigate carbon emissions. Um, how realistic is CCS carbon capture, given that we must stop emissions and remove long standing atmospheric CO2? There's been a distinct lack of success so far. Um, who on the panel would like to take on that question, please? Jonathan. I'm going to have a quick go, but I'm going to do so by by quoting uh, Professor Julian Allwood, who spoke at a uh, an event I was I was involved in last Monday. Um, 
He started his presentation by saying 50% of the change promised by politicians to deal with climate change are things that don't yet exist. He then declares himself really a, not a techno optimist, but a pragmatist, a realist. And he, and he said that there's a real problem that politics today hasn't recognized that there is a difference between gaining experience in something and deploying it. And he said that, you know, climate capture and storage really should be considered in the latter category. It's something we're still gaining experience in. It's something that isn't yet ready to be deployed at scale. It's, it's currently take up globally is 0.1% of emission reductions globally and three quarters of its deployment is linked to getting more fossil fuels out of the ground. So in his view, um, then if you take the, the UK government's position, which is net zero by 2050, and you recognize that you know, th this is not deployable at scale you know, in the foreseeable future, we should really, instead of considering the target to be net zero, we should be considering it to be absolute zero. We actually have to get everything else down to zero rather than relying on a get out of jail card that may not be available in the time we need it, leaving us stuck in jail. Quite right, thank you. Um, I'm gonna read out the next question, which is quite a long one from Cherry Waters. As well as reparation and mitigation, we need to stop doing further damage and pretending we're helping the carbon crisis by burning biomass to create our energy. To create our energy, we know all the good trees do in absorbing carbon from the atmosphere. But currently, the Kyoto Agreement allows us to pretend that cutting those very trees down and burning them is a good thing, because we can plant more trees, which in 40 years' time will do the jobs of the trees we just burned. That part of the Kyoto Agreement needs rescinding and a stop put on all biomass burning for energy production, replacing it with truly renewable sources such as hydro, sun, wind, tidal, etc. Green policy needs updating to reflect this. Um, I'm again, I'm going to throw this at the working group. Georgia, perhaps you'd like to answer that? Well, I mean, I, I, I completely agree with that. Maybe 50 years ago it would have been OK, but now it's not. This It's too late trees can't grow quick enough but the only caveat i would say is that so many of um, the countries in the global south have their main source of fuel is wood either gathered or chopped wood um so uh, and you know there are these kind of clean cook stoves that the development projects have been pushing for ages um but i don't think there's been i mean maybe annika you know of something but i don't know if there's been anything related to you know trying to get solar cook stoves or um you know that that kind of thing uh, there might be very small amounts of it out there but i this is a massive you know so you wouldn't want to jeopardize some people being able to do their cooking by having this policy and then making it illegal in certain countries without actually having something to replace it well the cook stoves are a civil society initiative and some private sector initiatives, right? It's not mainstreamed. If it's of course supported and advised by government, but has, but the resources, you know, mainstream resources have not been put into it. And actually, uh, I worked on a project in the year 2014 that was funded by DFID, that was focused on you know clean energy and and mainstreaming. Um, I, this uh, cook, clean cook stoves and all that, but um, the program was uh, halted, of course, due to you know change of uh, priorities and focus and everything. Uh, but you know it is such su such funding and such resources that push the climate conversation forward, right? So that's why I say that we cannot underscore the importance of of. Um, of these, um, you know, support the support that the global community offers, um, and and the CSR that comes from this um, multinational companies, although it does not make it okay for them to offer CSR to the global south while continuing to make the world, you know, a worse off place, and so you know we need to to call call out some of this uh, support because it covers a lot of, um, let me say not so good things for the climate, right? Uh, but I would say governments have not yet mainstreamed it as such, uh, yeah. Greenwashing. Jonathan. 
Um, just to say, I think there also might be a devil lurk, lurking in the detail of this biomass idea. Because if you cut down a tree, you can also plant a new one. And if you plant a new tree, lots of companies around the world are marketing this as, as carbon offsetting. So the, there is a real danger that, and, and, and also the new tree might be a plantation rather than a, a biodiverse woodland. So I think there's all kinds of connected problems with this. Um, but but I'm, I'm really concerned that that you, you also don't fall into a trap of doing something and it allows someone else to do something else. And I think we need to separate planting trees, which is good about increasing the resilience of the planet to, to absorb carbon with, with decarbonisation and, and try to put, see these as two separate but highly complementary activities rather than somehow one will bail out the other. Right, thank you all. Um, the next uh, point is more of a comment than a question, but I'm going to turn it into a question for Anika, if I may. The comment from Anthony Hearn is, to overcome what is in front of you, you've got to stop thinking what is good for your country, but what is good for this precious planet and all life on it, which is a sentiment I'm sure we'd all agree with. Um, but Anika, could I perhaps ask what inspires you to think globally rather than locally or both? Mm. Yeah, uh, you know, I am actually um, a youth uh, task force representative of the Generation Equality Forum, which is a multi-stakeholder space that is supposed to relaunch the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action. What I realized in this space is that um, multilateralism, you know, uh, affects our day-to-day -day lives. And it's as simple as who is in the room. Um, I remember when we were creating the action coalitions um, for generation equality, I remember thinking that the global greens are, uh, would be the best fit leader for the feminist climate uh, action, uh, feminist climate justice action. But um, there was very little communication, you know, simply because maybe our representative was not in the room. And so I realized uh, these spaces create the national agenda, they influence national policy, and this in turn influence uh, global resourcing, where the money goes. Uh, we must shift the conversation and the resources towards um, climate change. And this is affected by the global space. So that's why I realized that um, we cannot ignore, as much as we do, we push a lot of work on the ground, we plant a lot of trees, we are focused on uh, the blue economy. We cannot ignore the conversations that are happening globally because if, if we keep on uh, shifting the conversation, I'm not saying that girls' education is not important or you know, gender equality is not important. Everything is important, but we also need to mainstream the, con the climate conversation as well to be able to create the change that we need, right? Um, when, when, we, when we go to this year, for example, at the end of this year, we are having the GES summit by the Global Partnership for Education, which has been mainstreamed. We had the Generation Equality Forum mainstream, and all these are backed by resources, right? So that really made me um, know that um, we really need to influence the global space, but we cannot underscore the influence of the local to the global, because as I said earlier, politics being local influences global. All governments are, 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 are as a come from as a result of political parties. And these political parties get you know, votes from, from the locals. Political parties form governments and government influence national conversation and, 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 and global standpoints. So, you know, I, I think it was evident, I think from, from, from Trump and, you know, and, and what we are seeing with Boris, with the Brexit, political parties influence global conversation. So I think it is important that we invest in our political parties. Being green means that we have a voice in the global space. That is what interests me a lot about being in the global space. And that is why I keep going back and forth, pushing this agenda on both fronts. I, the, the local gives me the ammunition to speak at the global level. And so we cannot have these things existing in isolation, but creating a permanent consistent nexus between the local and the global keeps, will keep us excited and focused on what we need to achieve. Brilliantly put, thank you, Anika. Um, the next comment is uh, from Margaret Heath. Um, which I'm gonna turn into a question as well uh, for Georgia. Um, 
The comment is, I cannot see how reparations can be made given the UK's debt, coronavirus, funding required to retrain society for green energy and the like, plus the cost of damages to the UK from our own climate issues. Um, Margaret comments, I'm from the Global South originally, by the way. Georgia, how can we afford reparations? Well, um, maybe I can just go back a bit to um, what, because we, we got a question like this when we were trying to develop this policy, which was basically, we can't fit this into our spend, you know, spending plan. Um, and uh, because what happens with when you give climate finance an ODA, supposedly, is that you're giving money and it stays somewhere else. It doesn't circulate around the UK economy. Um, but I just going back to the kind of discussion we had about trade, you know, there's going to be lots of changes, which mean that more things will be done here, more, more food, there'll be more local food here more clothing there'll be more recycling i mean in a, you know in an ideal world <laughs> these the economic activity will be happening here in the uk so a lot of the um you know uh funds that might have been going you know to purchase goods and services overseas may not be um so you you may actually get more money circulating here because of the trade um situation and the other thing is that you know a lot of our investing companies that work overseas they will and all, all sorts of international companies they will be repatriating profits or putting them in some kind of offshore tax haven so you know and those those mounts are way 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 bigger than these <laughs> ODA figures and climate finance figures that we're talking about. So, you know, talking about taking some money out of our economy and putting it somewhere else, I think we absolutely can afford it. We should be doing it. And when I see the state of hospitals, I mean, you know, uh, health, health centers, uh, schools, um, you know, under nutrition, when I see, you know, when I see the state of things and you think, okay, well, I can't, I mean, obviously we have poverty here as well, but the infrastructure and lacking and the basic services lacking in so many countries and the lack of, you know, economic justice, lack of access to assets is, is so huge that you can't even compare them. So if we, if we can't actually, you know, and, and, and in fact, just going back to the original point, which was, this is a debt we have. So, you know, what do you do? You go to the bank and say, sorry, I can't pay it. I've got, I've got to go out and buy a new car and I'm going on holiday and I'm going out for dinner tonight. So sorry, can't pay the debt, guys. You know, that's what we're talking about. Um, we have to, you know, we have to pay it. We have an obligation and this is where we should be heading. Thank you, Georgia. That's going to be our last question that we've got time for, I'm afraid, because we're heading up to 6.30 now. And I just want to thank our excellent panellists um, for participating in this discussion. Thank you all very much indeed. And I want to thank do Holly Rose from the Green Party for setting all of this up so efficiently and gracefully. Thank you very much. Uh, but before we go, we want to remind those of you who are members of the Green Party that conference is coming up in October. And if you would like to contribute to creating or editing policy, this is the place to do it. Non-Green Party members are also welcome. Ticket sales launched today, so head to the website. And since the chat is not working, you can buy tickets via greenparty.org.uk forward slash conference forward slash. Finally, if you would like to join Caroline Lucas's launch of her Global Green Alliance when this event ends, the registration that event, which starts in 30 minutes, will greet you. The registration will greet you at the end of this. So thank you all so much for coming, for participating in that discussion, for all your excellent questions. We look forward to seeing you on the 2nd of August when we will discuss how the Green Party plans to fund our climate emergency policies. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Russ. Bye now.